Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, colleagues, thank you for joining us today, and a special thank you to our judges and Professor Rollins for giving us this opportunity to present our business. My name is Charles Taylor. I am the founder and CEO of Bickrid Software Solutions. Last summer, I worked at Connecticut Light and Power, a 1.1 million customer electric utility. While there, I spearheaded a $300 million grid improvement project, where I was tasked with development, creation, and implementation of all the grid improvements over the next five years. But I noticed one big problem. Utilities are incredibly slow and incredibly inefficient. And that is why I founded Bickrid Software Solutions. But I knew in order to have a team that could effectively decrease operating expenses and increase the labor efficiency of the utility, I needed to surround myself with the people who understood the industry best, which is where I put my team together. Joined with my partner and chief technology officer, Professor Volker Sorger, we are able to lead the market in understanding the trends of technology as they affect the industry. To get our operations to key, I pulled in my friend and fellow undergraduate, Chief Operating Officer Justin Hyde, who for the past year has worked at a Celeprise Venture Capital, working on the operations for multiple startups. And to make sure that we were ready to hit the market and actually execute our business, we pulled in the chairman of our board, Colin Gutman, a Yale graduate who is a partner at a Celeprise Venture Capital who has invested in over 40 firms and is the CEO of Work America, a staffing agency here in DC. But we knew that in this industry you have one huge problem, and that is getting into the market, which is why we made sure to surround ourselves with the best advisory board there is. Starting from a former senior advisor from, for the Department of Energy in Wendland Holland to a senior advisor in the Clintons with Brian O'Dwyer, we know that as a startup, we can meet with the big regulators and the heavy hitters in the government. We have George Benedetti, a utility engineer with over 20 years experience doing this job. Grant Allen, the senior vice president of ABB Technologies, one of the largest energy investment firms in the country. And Sean Heyman, an equity researcher who deals specifically with utilities, who not only knows the CEOs of every East Coast utility, but can get us a meeting with each and every one. So BitGrid's customer segment are the electric utilities. Who are they? Oh, you all know them. They are those to whom you send your electricity bill by the end of the month for cooking, lighting, heating, etc. What you may not know is, however, that the way they provide the service is through these power grids, which are quite antiquated. So the technology for power grids is about 100 years old, give or take. And the, some of the power lines serving us maybe right now in this, in, in this second are more than half a century old. So the power utilities are burdened by operating and maintaining these power grids, which spans over thousands of miles, and this is, is basically a large burden on them. The American Society of Civil Engineers has estimated that just to maintain the power grid right now, over the next 10 years, needs an investment of about $600 billion. Now, some of you have heard about smart grid, right? That does not include that number. Let's take a look into um, some trends, because from trends we can learn. Over the last 30 years, the demand for electricity has risen by about 65%. Now, more people are on the planet using more stuff, more electricity, more computers, etc. Now, that's a good thing, right? I can say this actually in one word, GDP growth. When we don't have growth, it's called recession. We don't like this. That's growth. That's good. However, the electric utilities are suppressed by the way they have to monitor and watch their investments. And that has led to a decrease in investment by about 50% over 30 years. So clearly we see this kind of gap opening up. In this industry, that gap is especially terrifying. And that is because a utility is a regulated market. When costs go up, they can't simply charge their consumers more. No one in this room would like if suddenly their electric bill hit $1,000 a month. The transmission and distribution industry made $215 billion last year. And while that may seem high, the average utility in the United States operates at a 6 to 7% profit margin, something that no business could actually survive doing. So how can we increase profits as a utility? The way to increase profits is to cut costs. And there are a few ways you can cut costs. You could fire people, you could not invest in the grid, or you could find where your problems are and efficiently solve them which is what they do now with single solution providers, also known as consulting. 
-hmm. In the Greek methodology, there is this gentleman, Sisyphus, by the name of, Sis of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was tasked to roll up this big stone up the hill. As soon as he succeeded, it tumbled down. He had to go again, up, 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 tumble down for the rest of his life. Pretty tedious. Turns out, electricity utilities are pretty much in that same space as this poor Sisyphus. What they have to do, for example, in a given year, they have 10 projects that, would, that they have to invest to fix the grid or to keep the grid just simply running. Can they invest into all 10? Answer is no, about two to three on average. That means seven are unattended in year one. Year two, 10 new problems. Can they attend those? Again, no. So first year, seven not attended. Second year, 14, 21, you get the idea. So that basically relates to this. So in summary, we can say there are two fundamental challenges for utilities. Number one, operational challenges. Number two, financial ones. So until it goes and it finds the three solutions it's going to solve in one year, they go to huge companies, Deloitte's, McKinsey's, UCS's. These are companies who have specialized utility consultants who will come in the industry, find a problem, create a solution, and leave. These problems come at a premium. The average software solution costs one to three million dollars per project. This is a number utilities cannot maintain, let alone the fact that when Deloitte comes in, Deloitte creates a Deloitte Band-Aid to the problem, not a utility Band-Aid. So these, why do these Band-Aids do not work? Actually, we have the answer. Blackouts, power outages. <laughs> And while maybe a power outage seems to be like maybe a mere inconvenient delaying, you know, cooking, uh, 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 cooking someone's uh, turkey over Thanksgiving, it turns out there is a huge economic loss associated to them. $150 billion every year. It's, it's in a single year. This is where BitGrid comes in. At BitGrid, we allow the utility engineers to invest smarter. Instead of going out and getting a single solution, to where you go through long contracts and charge an incredible amount of money, Bickrid works on a subscription model. Our utilities pay us per their customers. And from that model, we provide continuous improvement to their solutions, creating our own technology in-house with their guys. Not only that, we offer academic research as a partnership, something that anyone in the industry knows is valuable when you go to convince a regulator how much something costs. This is something that no current competitor in this space offers. Deloitte may have research, but it is funded by Deloitte by the utility. This, this model is scalable for any size, whether it's a small local utility or one of the massive investor-owned utilities. It is also scalable for any size project, whether it's fixing an Excel document or running a fully analytical simulation. What you can see here is the first example of our MVP of one of our solutions. And this solution is for grid planning, the way they make the wire, poles and wires on your house go from A to B. This is a very tedious process, done right now on a map. We have a group of guys who sit down at a map, go look at the first point and the last point, and fill in how many ways they can get there. They have their own priorities. Perhaps it's decreasing the amount of customers in every segment, or making sure that the mayor has his power at all times. This, this technology was considered or called the future of grid planning by the Director of Technology Integration at Connecticut Light and Power. What we allow them to do is take all the information, everything they want to value, and automatically input it, at which point our software will run an algorithm to give them every possible solution that they can get and automatically rank them based on what they value. Our software solutions are used by engineers and analysts, the guys at the desk who take a lot of time to do their work. But the more time they save and they can spend doing something else cuts the bottom line for the vice presidents and directors of these companies, a bottom line that ties directly to their bonuses every single year. So how much can a typical project take in grid planning? If you were to plan a single circuit, about two miles of line, of which there are thousands in every single utility, it takes about 44 hours of engineering work. That includes field work, analysis, evaluation, presentation, and exception. Using our software, we could create a 60% more efficient process by cutting out significantly the analysis and evaluation piece. Using our software, we allow the utilities to save a significant amount of money in just this one solution. So, these guys have told you a lot about how we can save money for the utilities, but this is a business plan competition, ladies and gentlemen, so how are we gonna make the money? We're gonna do this by charging the utilities 
on a model that is unheard of in this space, which is charging them by the users and not by the solution. So what this allows us to do is with our pre-negotiated rate, it allows us to give the utility the ability to control and predict their expenses, which in such a heavy regulated market is extremely valuable to them as they cannot do a lot of long-term investment. Each year we'll increase our price a little bit, but this is mere fractions of a percentage on your utility bill for solutions that used to cost them exponentially more. And what this, and what this means is that in our first year alone, we're going to work with one utility so, so that we can grow smarter and execute better, which will ultimately allow us to pick up three to four utilities each subsequent year, ultimately servicing 42.3 million customers in the United States across 18 of the 202 investor-owned utilities for about $45 million in revenue annually, allowing us to take our company, company public in our seventh year of operations. So what is Bicrit? We presented this macro problem, a very complicated problem given the industry. We've told you how their solution, how they're trying to get this done, going to individual consultants, is costing them a lot of money, and more importantly, impeding their growth. And we've told you how we could address that. At Bickrid, we are a software solutions provider, not a consultant. However, we could provide the same efficiency savings using our software at a much lower cost. Using our subscription model, we stay with the utility. We don't leave. That means we allow for continuous improvement. That continuous improvement means that regardless of what they need, they are going and charging more to where they can't do it. A big problem with the way it's done now is consultants come in and create a software solution. But when they leave, utility engineers don't know how to use it. And the cost of training them is so high that they can't afford to use this software that they just spent $3 million building. Our model is scalable because we base it on the amount of customers that the utility can get. And our service is based on a rate for what we are offering. We, offer, we pay a little more every year. So the utility might pay us a cent on a customer and the year after two to three cents. But with that increase, we offer more and more solutions as well as a more dedicated team. Whether it's a small utility, a big utility, Bicrid can make the difference. We allow huge cost savings for a utility and an enormous rate of invest, return of investment. You may ask, how is saving a minute of time or an hour of time a capital saving for a utility? In fact, due to government regulation, expenses and capital is split for a regulating utility, meaning that every dollar you spend on expense, which is labor, engineering costs, software, you could actually spend 12 to $15 in capital expenses. This is something we experienced this summer when instead of spending $15 million in our first year of this program, of the $300 million program, we could only spend 10 because we had spent our entire expense having engineers go out on the field and plan these events. So a big problem we have and we understand being in this space is that it is the utilities. Utilities are impossible to get into, which brings us to why we're here and where the money will go. Bicrid has already done customer development with four of the largest investor-owned utilities on the East Coast. We have met with over 20 executives leading in the space. Not only that, we have crossed our biggest hurdle, which is getting in the market. Bicrid is happy to be partnering with the ninth largest investor-owned utility on the East Coast to start implementing our solutions and perfecting our model. This money goes straight to product development, not to marketing, not to securing how we can get things. We are going to be working within Northeast Utilities to make sure that they could save their money and their time, and we will grow as a business. Because together, we, we are, are grid grid. <laughs>
you have less need for software because it's pretty easy to manage a square block. The grid is changing very quickly these days, smart grid products, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what about potential competitors uh, moving into this space because, you know, there are a lot of bright engineers writing code today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the way we address that is our business model and penetration. By getting in the market first, we're able to grow much faster and control our expenses much better than any of those competitors. As anyone who in the space knows, being a startup and getting inside is the hardest thing to do, regardless of how many people you have. In particular, like in this market. Yeah. Oh, yeah. An example Border being O-Power. The reason O-Power was able to succeed is because they were founded by an individual who worked in the industry for decades and knew every single person. The key is if you're successful with Northeast, it'll be domino yeah. effect. Exactly. Believe me, I've seen it. In fact, we do have a, um, a, um, an interview or um, an appointment coming up with the CEO of Northeast um, by midsummer. So where we're trying to get a basic of first $200,000 contract. Uh, you mentioned you're going to use the funds for product development. Uh, what are the next steps in your product development? How, much, how secure are you in your thinking of you have the product? Uh, obviously, you need more. You wouldn't be going that way. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about the, the, the shortcomings you so, see? So, uh, for sure, an excellent question. One thing to keep in mind is that we are a software service product. What we showed you is one of the softwares in which we are developing. We currently have more than three software as well as some hardware to integrate back into current software, all being in the process of being patented. So that's where we get protected on that end. This money goes into actually fully developing. We could create the best algorithm that we think, but it's going to cost us a lot of money when we go to meet with their engineers and they say that this is more valuable or this is more valuable and making sure the interface is directly to them. So, so most of that cost right. is towards product development and engineering time. So, in a sim so basically, like in simple words, like um, uh, Charles is exactly correct. What we're trying to do, we're trying to create a partnership with them. So instead of going out and do a solution that maybe someone wants, the idea is to really almost organically grow with them. Is this, each product then going to be unique, or is this going to be a, a product that is generic? So this actually goes on our model. When we have this a product such as the grid planning, it is a very, very detailed process. So this is a product that will grow based on how much the utility wants. Perhaps they want it to start being automatic without their input, or they just want that. And if that's the case, we move on to other operations. So there are much smaller operations that we do do uniquely. However, much of our time is perfecting and expanding on the most expensive parts of planning. Uh, talk a little bit about, it, it seems as though you're gonna rely on universities, um, universities to provide you with some credibility in this mm -hmm. space, right? So talk a little bit about your philosophy around partnering with universities, what that looks like, who owns that, kind of the mechanics around that, because that seems to be crucial to you getting in the door and having credibility. Absolutely, right, great. Um, and the, the plan, our plan essentially is to have some in-house um, in development and in R&D, but also have something outsourced. And this could, this could be in terms of like a contract, for instance, um, with, um, a university research group, like myself, for instance. <laughs> the Sorter Group. But the Sorter Group, there you go. Um, and this is, I mean, these are practices that, like, that are done like, on a routine basis. Um, currently, my group has a contract with IBM, for instance. This could be something similar to with BitGrid. And one key to understand is why we want the academic partnership. It's not necessarily that our solutions won't work without it. As a subscriber to our services, we provide the utility with academic research and papers supporting their claims. So when a utility goes to a regulator and says, to up maintain our grid, we need $200 billion, which is the case of Connecticut Light and Power, the, utility res or the regulators responded with, here's $300 million. <laughs> Well, having an academic researcher and that independent body who isn't being directly funded by your organization brings a lot more pull when you go in and ask for money. Credibility. Credibility. Yeah. Um, it sounds like I'm hearing from you like you're, you're, you're trying to achieve, you haven't said this, but trying to achieve some social impact by closing that gap you talked about between the disinvestment and, 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 and the increase in cost. Absolutely. Talk and about that. Something that to be considered is you know, why are we going into software and not hardware? When you invest in a software on the grid, you can prevent the need for all this hardware that you know, we'd normally need. Mm -hmm. So a switch, which is something that could control how much power is through and monitor it, a single switch can cost $50,000. Put that in perspective, every single pole you see on the street would probably need a switch to be a truly smart grid. You can't afford to do that. However, there are switches on the lines, a little less expensive, much less data, that implementing the software allows them to expand the longevity of the grid. 
And by the way, smart grid alone is estimated to cost about, about 700 billion to really <laughs> fully functionalize this, for which there's no money, really. On, on top of the existing $673 yes. billion. Dollars. Can you talk a little bit about the subscription model and in particular, who is managing, so the software exists, they subscribe, what's the role of your team versus the role of the utility and managing, using, overseeing all of that? Absolutely, so mm -hmm. our services are done in the cloud, so we don't actually have to host them on their server. However, some utilities would prefer that and we could very easily accommodate it. What we do is we work with them, so in terms of development, we don't just go and develop something and then come and ask after. We make sure that while we're doing it, we're doing it with their current practices and how they actually want it to be used so that way they don't have to train each other. So it's really a cooperative into who's using it and who's uh, developing it. And then in terms of managing it, are you all we will actively involved throughout the life of that contract or is it their engineers and their staff who are no, That's the key that? difference is that as a subscription model, we are actively monitoring, improving, okay. and managing that software versus the current way where it is a single solution sold back and then they're left in the dark. 10 seconds. I think you've answered all their questions. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Very good.